put it on top. This is Gene Bosler at Texas Southern University in Houston, Texas, attending a talk by Cynthia okay, McKinney uh, at this point, on her recent visit to questions. Libya. Uh, just stand up uh, wherever you're at, uh, say your name, and then we'll take you from there. Sist stand up, please. I have a question, but the, the um, bill there. needs to be running so we can download completely while we have a question and answers. That's what he's doing, right? It's not moving. It's downloading. They're downloading. Yeah, it's moving. Yeah, they did that. Okay. Does anybody have any questions at this, this is point Cynthia for McKinney. any of our panelists? Cynthia McKinney, stand up. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, uh, Cynthia, would you share with us? You mentioned that the United States of Africa was something that. I think that you or Suleiman mentioned that the United States of Africa was something that Omar Gaddafi was working on. Could you tell us a little bit more about how that transpired and where that is at this particular point? Okay, sure. Uh, come to the mic. Yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, United States of Africa is about on NATO integration. Africa, yeah. Africa has been divided for so long, from slavery and also um, recent times economic divisions, and then plus social divisions of the corner. The, the corner of Africa has been divided based on artificial lines. It's not only its natural state, whereby the people have been divided from their uh, natural habitat. That's something that's been are debated by, from African Federation since six and uh, seven centuries ago. Then, our problem today is just simply we, we've seen so many failures. We ask ourselves uh, as Libyans, why does Africa keep us you know, failing? Why, instead of Africa progressing with all the natural resources and its people, Africa always keeps on going backwards. The head. People, African people, deceived, robbed, stolen from African soil. Then, the most precious natural resource any continent or any country can have is its people. But why are African people taken from its soil? And up to now, some of them were being told that they were being sold to Africa. Or African people sold them to their masters. We want to see transactions of that. Okay? Because that's one, one case we don't accept. I think it's fictitious from start to end. We're going to the fact. What Libya is determined to do right now, Libya will only deal with the facts. We don't want bogus here saying that, and this had happened. We want historical facts. That this African leader was dirty. That's why we're open. The committee, uh, the tribal federations and committees of Africa are very, very transparent. You can speak your mind, even though it doesn't matter how dirty the speech is, but we want, we want to listen from you. We want to hear from you. What do you have to say? What happened? The other part is passport. Wherever you go to, you cross any African country, you need a passport. You have to pay tariffs for this and that, and the taxes are one of the hardest you know, in border crossings in the world. But those taxes don't help Africa. They're helping France, someone take you from here to the United States. And this has been going in one family for like maybe five, six, seven, you know, I think eight generations. So we are saying, oh, that's enough. That's more than enough. Why do I need to cross with my pickup if I just have one pickup to cross with my goods to Congo? And it costs me $250. 
then to go from Congo to Sudan another two hundred fifty dollars, and I'm only getting maybe two thousand dollars worth of stuff. How much markup do I have to make if I really want to sustain myself? So we're saying to African people, hell no, you don't need to be paying so much taxes to be taken to the front. If that tax is good, you go ahead and construct the roads, and you don't you don't have to pay the excessive bills. You need unity. Uh, if in unity we can cut all the strength and we can cut all the bogus transaction deals, so it can be cheaper for African people and it will benefit the economy. Then another option is uh, why Africa needs unity is because. Africa was paying $500 million every year just to lease satellite, satellite communication systems from Western companies such as the AT&T. Why would you want to pay $500 million every year to connect a phone call? For example, to call United States, I think, in 1990s, if you, you want to call from United States to Africa, it costs you over a dollar per minute. Then you have to call it if you are from French colony, you gotta call France first. The call will be transferred from France to Africa. <coughs> then the uh, the, the phone operator here charges a fee, then the other one in France will charge. <coughs> then also to connect it to Africa, you have to they have to charge a fee. Uh, this thing was it was so expensive. A dollar per minute just for phone call, we said no. We are going to launch our own satellite system. That's and right. that will cut off through, you know, that, that will cut through any kind of uh, bureaucracy happening in the commercial sector. The first time we cut that off, we heard that uh, one U.S. company, what do you call uh, this? It was it was another phone company besides AT&T. Uh, I I don't remember the name, but uh, it's with this, it starts with the C. You know, Southwestern Bell. Okay. No, no, no. MCI. MCI filed for bankruptcy because they've been charging us too much, and all that mostly all that money was coming from Africa because of international and long distance. Okay, if you call China right now, China has one of the cheapest what telephone communication system, and you need communication is very very important. If you need to call your, your niece, your sister, brother, family member, you need a, a cheaper phone call. And it's, it's one of the fastest means to do business. So we said, no, we're going to take that off. Uh, if, we take, if we take the excessive what, bills from the United States or Europe and Africa, we save at least $1.5 billion. And we can transfer that $1.5 billion to any African country that needs it's roads being paid. So we start we say who needs who, who is the most needy African country? Zambia. Uh, let's say another one is Chad. If we have surplus amount of money, we say, okay, every child that needs a computer in Chad, Libya will buy. It. So uh, instead of people paying all that access in communication, we will use that for e-learning. So such that uh, in Africa, you can do telemedicine. Uh, you can do maybe uh, learning from long distance learning. Right. So it saves a lot of students' work, money, and resources. These resources are being ripped off Africa, and they have to stay down there. Uh, the other part is why we need um, why we need also Conero unit is what our people, African people, are being so much divided. There is, there is a fighting in almost every African family where they are not only divided by border lines, they can't visit that family because they can't. And it's, it's not only happening within Africa, it's also in Palestine. You know, Palestine is part of Africa. That Israel right there is part of Northeast Africa. Clapping to the comment that Palestine is part of Northeast Africa. We are not against them, okay? We told them, if you want to stay in Africa, you gotta behave yourself. Right. And if you keep on killing people, you're not beating anybody, you're not, you're not helping them, but you're constantly killing sure. billions. Ask yourself, how much money United States has been spending in killing machines? Trillions! Now their schools are failing. 
they are not just killing in Africa, in Gaza, in, in, in any part of the world, but they don't have money for their elder people's health care, and they don't even have money for schools. But they got a million dollars to pay for a bomb. We said no. That's not going to happen during Libya's watch. We still got 6.5 million people. The only way the United States will impose those kinds of characters on us is to kill the entire colony or the entire nation. If one of us is still remaining, we'll fight them to the last point. Libya is not going to apologize for it. We demand respect and we want it. Yes. That's right. Yeah. We demand it. We're not going to beg it from them. No way. That will never happen because a lot of people have done that for a long time. It's our country, it's our corner, and we are in it, and it's for us. That's right. That's why we need you. That's right. I also just wanted to say that um, one of the journalists that I took on the delegation was from South Africa. And he actually has a television station, and he uses that satellite. Uh, brothers and sisters, there is a petition that's being circulated. Let's not forget that. Uh, this petition is for our Independent Civilian Review Board with prosecutorial and subpoena power that we want to get established in Houston. So while we're uh, doing our questions and answering, and uh, questions and answers as well as watching the video. Make sure you don't leave here without signing that petition. Don also has a petition over here for the Green Party candidate um, candidates, but let's make sure we get that signed. Next question. Hello there. My name is Keisha Rogers. I am a Jewish uh, activist, former candidate for Congress, twenty six of Jewish Democratic candidates, and I'd like to thank you for your comments today. Uh, what I want to address is something that Brother Muhammad has brought up and all of you have brought up is that the thing that we should be very focused on is this question of how do we destroy the British colonialism, uh, the imperial faction who has put forth uh, the continuation of a policy of genocide, not only in Africa, but uh, pitting nations against each other for many, many, many centuries now. And the way I see we do that is we shut down the economic power uh, shut down their imperialism, their ability to be funded. And this is only going to be done by the people getting together to demand that no more policy of British, the British Empire any longer being able to control over the sovereignty of nation states. I mean, we see right now, and this has brought, been brought up many times, that the entire global financial system is bankrupt. The dollar is about to lose its value. The only way that we're going to put a stop to that is to go back to real economic production without the control of British colonialism. The second thing is we have to hold our Congress members accountable. And thirdly, we have to immediately demand the removal of the British puppet in the White House, Barack Obama. So that's what I'm calling for. And if people are serious, we cannot just talk, but we have to say, what are the economic policies that are continuing to destroy the sovereignty of nation states. You look at an uprisings going on in, in uh, Greece, across the entirety of Europe, and this is a policy that is pitting nations against each other. So I like your comments on that, and we're, we have a solution right now on what can be done to address the uh, breakdown of sovereign nation states. Okay, and thank you. The policy. Thank you. There was a question somewhere in there. <laughs> but, uh, I think the I think the, the key is is that going back to the uh, first question, and of course the answer comes from Brother Suleiman, and that is that the United States of Africa could go a long way in terms of solving the problems for people on the continent of Africa. And this is, as Brother said, an old idea, and it cost the lives of some giants in the African movement. I mean, we're all familiar with Patrice Lumumba. Yes. There is uh, <clears throat> the concept that was pushed by a number of African leaders 
who became independent one country after another. I think they were, the number got up as high as maybe 19 countries who shook off the uh, shackles of that British colonialist uh, country that you just talked about. Just a mere fact, we take so much for granted in this country that there's, there's been no invasion here. I mean, think for a moment, if this country was invaded, what would you do? If someone showed up at your door, at your house, and said, get out, I think you would do some very serious, dangerous things to that person. You would never leave your land. You would never accept the new government. So you would have to see how other people around the globe are reacting. It would be the same way you would react if this country was invaded. There is also this situation where when you have a country that meddles in the affairs of this country, to stop the growth of this country. For instance, Barack Obama is elected president, and then an outside government comes in, invades, creates this caricature of Barack Obama being incompetent, that he's a monster, he's a devil, and the people here should rise up against him. Can you imagine what would happen here? For one moment, could you imagine what would happen here? Because that's what this country does to us. And then you look at those countries and say, why can't they do what democracy? Well, it's kind of difficult to do it when you're constantly intervening, constantly meddling. And then when some of our citizens get killed, we ask the question, why do they hate us? I mean, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but what I'm saying is, is that if Africa had the opportunities that this country had, where you could drive from South Africa to Libya, same roads, okay? If you had a train system that could go from, let's say, Egypt to Algeria, if you had the same currency that you could use in South Africa that you use in Libya. For instance, I can spend a dollar here in Houston, I'm out of Dallas. Or I could trip over into Oklahoma and that dollar's still good. Other countries in the continent of Africa and the leadership there tried that. It was working so well, this government again used the CIA or whatever else and intervened. Right. Killed off those leaders because they want Africans starving. Mm -hmm. So they can be on TV someplace and saying, help this orphan child. Right. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. And to show you the strength of that unity, and I'll take my seat, look at what happened with Kwame Nkrumah. First elected African on the continent, if you will, in Ghana. And by the way, if you all have not had an opportunity to go to Ghana, right. you got to go to Ghana. But along with that, get the speech of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who traveled there in 1957. Mm -hmm. It's called The Birth of a New Nation. Yeah. It's about Ghana. Right. Well, he was a Pan-Africanist telling Negroes to move to Ghana. That's Dr. King, 1957. Still, here's what happened there. Kwame Nkrumah creates a concept of a government that works very, very well, that other countries decided they wanted to adopt that as well. Even today, it's a model for the, for the, for the, for the continent. And while he was away, as people would do in fighting, there was a coup. He's no longer president of Ghana while he's away. He goes to Guinea, where Seiko Toure was president. Seiko Toure gave Kwame Nkrumah his presidency. <coughs> and Kwame said, no, we will share it. So 
So they were co-presidents of Guinea. That's the type of unity that was moving at the time. We heard Malcolm and others talk about it. So this is what the brothers talking about. I mean, I know sometimes it gets a little mixed when we talk about you know languages, and sometimes we can't understand. So I thought I'd bring it to you, as Malcolm says, speak to the man in his own language. Bring it to you in a simple term. That what he's talking about is not nonsense. That this is happening on that continent. People are now saying they're sick and tired of the Westerners sticking their nose in their business because it's obvious they don't know where they're going. This country's failing. Right. We all know that. That's the big elephant in the room. Okay? And by the way, you can't go back to what used to work that made this country really prosper. It was 300 years of slavery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I ain't going back in. Okay? So can't go back to slavery. Because we ain't had it. Yeah. So the, the reality is, is that we must say to this government, stay out of other folks' business. Spend your time here. Be creative. And if nothing else, the Nation of Islam taught us one thing. They taught us how to make money. That's right. Them brothers knew how to hustle. We need to get back to some of that creativity. Right. Instead of saying ain't no jobs. That's right. Create a doggone job. Yeah. 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 Teach, man. So, again, taking my seat. <laughs> ain't anti anyone. I'm just saying it's time for us to start thinking. And that's what Cynthia does for us. That's right. Goes all over the globe and bring that information back. Not just in Libya. Hundreds of places where people are doing very, very well with simple democracy. That is sharing, caring, learning, passing it on. Thank you. Very quickly, based upon that, it came to mind, and I didn't mention it, something that we really need to look at and really put Iran and Libya on America, British, NATO's target list, and that is them demanding or them beginning to talk about and have open discussions about not taking the dollar for their oil. Yes. Yeah. And then Gaddafi talking about tying the dinar to gold. You want to know why they can't just topple him? Do you know that I read that NATO ran out of bombs? Yeah. That's right. And now Germany said, well, we'll supply you with the armament you need. It's right. because Gaddafi has, he's sitting on a mountain of gold. That's right. Come on. And that's why he can sustain his battle. They say that I've heard uh, Mr. Brzezinski and others talking about this. Sometimes we don't want to watch those things. We're busy. And again, I talk about distraction, not this crowd. But our friends are distracted. This is ESPN 1, ESPN 2, ESPN Classic, ESPN Spanish. There's HBO 1, HBO 2, HBO Latino. Look, we are just distracted. Each one of us have our own individual iPod. We got a, our children have a, a television in each room. Nobody talks to no, one another <laughs> or anything anymore. So what's happening is, is that we're being distracted by the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the Casey Anthony case, yeah. where the whole world doing on that, while at the same time, these demons in Washington, D.C., get ready to determine to bankrupt this country and your future. You got no future. We paid our dues. Listen, we gave this country 310 years of our blood, sweat, and tears. We're the first one to die in the so-called revolution. We fought on the side of the North in the Civil War, the Spanish-American War, the Vietnam War, Korean War, you name it. We there, we paid the price. We got a right to say whatever we want to say to whoever we want to say, not only about what goes on domestically, but foreignly. But you need to know what the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad said. He said America sealed its doom when it went off the gold standard. That's right. That's right. That's right. He told us in message to the black man, he said, you should never buy more than two suits a year, and you should never pay more than $65 per suit. Now, come on. <laughs> How you going to pay $65? Can you imagine right now me talking about I'm going to dress myself to the press for $65 a suit? You can't do it. Now, why? Is it, is it that the wool or cotton cost uh, uh, is more? Same Silk time. is more? No, the dollar is worth less. That's right. The gold is what will sustain, because the Gaddafi ain't going nowhere. He gonna, he gonna live and die in this country. He's not going anywhere. And that is gonna seal the doom. Mr. Parker, I said this, and, and I am through. 
saying this. He's saying even the even the evil minded satanic minds ain't working for themselves out there. They're at cross purposes right now. They don't know what they're doing. They're confused. And in this confusion, people who have good hearts and good minds need to come together and come up and organize themselves yep. for what is our own self-interest. As he wrote in, in Our Savior's Arrived, there's an old world going out and there's a new world coming in. You got to choose which one you're going to be a part of. Thank you. Teach, man. Yeah. A lot of people have questions. So hold on one second. Yeah. Uh, let, like, like, what we're going to do now? Let, why don't you let like three people ask their questions? Yeah, we need to get the ball rolling here. This gentleman right here has had his hand up for a moment, and these people here also. And what we're going to do, if we have time afterwards, we'll come back to the rest of you guys. But go ahead, the gentleman standing up right here. I have two questions, and whoever can ask. We need one question because uh, we don't have enough time here. Okay. Give us one good question. Uh, how has the war affected Libya's economy so far? I know you. I just uh, my question is very simple. I just want to know: Al Green and Shell Jackson Lee did not come. Did they bother calling and saying that they were not coming? Uh -huh. did, uh, you know. No, they didn't bother calling. They didn't bother coming. Mm. And back to your question, mm. uh, are y'all going to address that? Okay, and one more question, you right here. Excuse me, first of all, thank you, and a very quick comment. Um, the fine gentleman from Dallas mentioned this about this country funding Israel, we need to get out of that. I hope you can all open your minds to what I see as the truth is that we don't fund Israel. This is Israel of the West. Who owns, and I'm not, I don't think I have to prep, I have to preface this, unfortunately, but I think all of you probably understand, I'm not anti-Semitic, I'm not racist, I'm a human being that cares for others. And if you look at the reality, who owns and controls the media? <laughs> reality is not an issue, it's our, in, it's our perception, that could be a fake video, our perception of, I'm not saying it is, perception of that. Do you have a question? So I, yes, I do, I'll continue real quick, anyway. They own and control everything, if we don't go after the head of the beast, then we're not going to get anywhere. And my question for you is, as an activist, people always talk about, we need to call your congressmen, as you mentioned, and stuff. I tell people, that's pointless. They're bought and sold, and if they're not, they don't have a voice. Do you, from your experience, really think that any letters or emails really make any difference? My opinion is it's a good cop, bad cop. If you do win, it's just give a little, take the time. Good question. Okay, um, the, the second question. The economy. The, oh, the economy is in the tank. The economy of Libya is in the tank. In 2000, well, we were there in January of this year, 2011, and there were cranes everywhere. There are buildings everywhere because uh, the Libyan government believes that um, housing is a right. According to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it is a right, even though our own country subscribes to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but it doesn't practice. That's right. Libya practices. And so they were building houses for everybody. <coughs> and everywhere across um, and you can see them now, all of that construction has been stopped because the workers are in the camps because the workers are, come from other parts of Africa and there was this lie that, um, that you know, that they were bombing in Tripoli, that, that first lie that went out and everybody fled. And um, so they're still there on the border. They're not sending remittances back home. So back home is hurting. They're hurting because they're living in camps. And some of the countries, by the way, are sponsoring these camps are also participating in the bombing, like United Arab Emirates. And so... Uh, Libya's growing 
It was probably growing by leaps and bounds. And it has all ground to a halt. In fact, you can see the long, you will see in this video, you will see the lines. Because NATO, well, what the gentleman said, we've seen the Israelization of NATO policy in Libya. Because Libyan farmer, uh, Libyan uh, uh, fishermen can't go out and fish anymore because the NATO prevents them from fishing. They bombed a, a fisherman about three or four days ago. And he was out, you know, in his boat and they just bombed him. Um, and that's just like Israel treats Gaza. Um, they also blockade fuel. So you will see cars. I've never seen. You remember the lines that people formed uh, just to go and vote in uh, 2004 to get uh, Bush out? And you see the pictures of all of the lines. I mean, can you imagine that multiplied 25 or 50 times because these cars are parked. They park their cars in line. And the lines <coughs> go on for days. And they park there because there's no fuel. And uh, NATO is preventing the uh, 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 fuel, importation of fuel. They are a petroleum producing country, but they have to import the fuel. Interesting point there. Um, and then, in the midst of the bombing, NATO will not allow medication to come in. So, food, fuel, and medications are prohibited from coming in because of NATO's blockade. And now, and they're also bombing. So you can imagine that there is uh, very little of an economy. The economy is in a shambles. And if Suleiman has anything to add, um, you, you may certainly do that. <coughs> Yeah, actually there is a problem with the Libyan economy, internal economy. Uh, besides that, Libya has a lot of external reserves because Libya are soft 90% uh, of its economy outside. So what they are just bombing in Libya is a structural. But as far as the cash and gold is, is concerned, Libya still has $785 billion for citizens' consumption money. That's money from inside United States, China, Russia, and uh, United Kingdom. So we are not, I don't expect Libya to be bankrupt for the next 10 years in case of the war, if that's the case. But when it comes to fuel, uh, the fuel is a problem. But we also have some you know, fuel reserves, which the army can use. The ordinary people, we don't want really too many people to travel because we don't know who is who. That's right. There are a lot of people in there. It's not that we run out of out of fuel completely. No, we have underground barrels of fuel which are still in reserve, and those are mostly for the army's use. Only civilians are the ones that are experiencing a lot of uh, fuel shortages, but other. As far as the military operations are concerned, we got plenty of fuel. I want to also a bit more directly uh, address your question about whether it's uh, um, useful to uh, call or write or send emails to our members of Congress. I think that we must do that. Yeah. And we must do that even though you understand, you know, that um, uh, many of them, um, well, I, uh, well I, I won't say. Um, I think it's important for us to let our representatives know what we think. That's right. Yeah. And so they get away, they get a free pass if we allow them to sell us out and we just go in and vote for them and we don't tell them what we expect of them. We give them a free pass to sell us out. 
Let's make it a little bit more difficult for them. Ah! Oh! In the audience, we have Minister of Information J.R. and Malcolm X's grandson. Stand up! that they're here on campus and we don't we we'll, would we'll be remiss without having you guys say a few words uh, right. so brother Thomas just bear with me and um, and then we're going to play 10 minutes into the video mm -hmm. we can play seven minutes seven minutes and then we'll get out of here dr jones that good all right thank you come on up. I actually expect to get up here and speak. Uh, so, but, um, what I will say is that it was an honor and a pleasure uh, to be with Jr. on the delegation of Cynthia McKinney um, in Africa. It was my first time in Africa. It was a lot different than I had expected it to be. I've been all over the Middle East, from Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, Dubai, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and my first time in Africa, in Libya. And you know, it's interesting because everything that we see on the media now. And my grandfather once said it best. He said that the media is a very dangerous thing, the mainstream media, because through the media, they have the power to make the victim look like the oppressor yeah. and the oppressor look like the victim. Yeah. But what I can say is that when I was there, you know, we met with people from the common folk all the way up to uh, Gaddafi himself. And, you know, it's funny how people, they don't know the history of a country. They don't know the politics, the religion, the culture. Yet within a few weeks, everybody is a perfect expert on what's happened in right. Libya, right. what's going on in Egypt, right. the people's revolution. Many people don't even understand what it is to have a revolution. And where is it that they get this information? They get it from the mainstream media. Um, what was interesting to me when I got there to see many of the families there, they had second homes that they would go to and stay at on weekends. Many of them owned small businesses. And there was menial labor that a lot of them wouldn't do. So uh, a lot of uh, people would migrate from other countries and come in and do, the, do this menial work. Um, they, had, um, they were pretty well off. They had means to travel. They had passports. If they don't like Libya, they can leave Libya. You know, and it's no problem. I don't know many Libyans outside of Libya. Um, I feel like the people, they felt that they had a stake and a say-so in the land. Right. If they wanted to have a hospital built in the community, they could come together, put forth a, a vote, and a hospital would be uh, constructed. 
Um, I know that Gaddafi took over the country when he was 27 years old. Mm. I'm 26 years old, so that to me is amazing in itself. And also, before Gaddafi took over, Libya statistically was the poorest nation <coughs> in the world. In the world. At the time when we were there, before NATO intervention, um, it's the wealthiest nation in Africa. Yes, you know, it's wealthier than Egypt, and it's okay. up there along with Saudi Arabia. Yes, and they have oil, yet they distribute their oil differently than that of the Saudi Arabian government. They distribute it uh, more so amongst the people. Yes. So this is very interesting. They had an embargo against the people over 40 something years in the same fashion that they had an embargo against Cuba. Yet, um, right. look at the economics of Cuba, look how the, the conditions of the people in Cuba are, the living conditions, and compared to that of Libya, Libya was beautiful. Libya was beautiful. Um, and <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I just want to say that, um, again, it was an honor and a blessing to travel, you know, with, with Cynthia and have her bring us, travel with my comrade Malcolm Rashida, who also came with us. Um, she's not here with us today. But what I thought was, first off, what I want to say is I think it's very important, and we made a point, because we had an event that started at the exact same time as this. We made it a point to come show our support for uh, Cynthia McKinney due to the fact that she's a courageous voice. Like... Yes. None that we have breathing that I know of right now. That's in, yeah. you know, that's in our position. You know, as far as the international peace activists. And I think that we as a community, us as progressive peoples, we need to not just support her by coming to events, but support her in all the ways that she needs to be supported. She's raising money for the dignity trip and, and a bill that she has to bring people out there so we can see for ourselves that through the media lies that, that my comrade just talked about and she doesn't have too many people that are supporting her uh, financially or none of that so we gotta if we like what she's doing we need to materially support it don't just support it in the abstract way but support it materially with, with your check you know a lot of you, uh, I, well, I don't mean to go against nobody religion but some of y'all is tied in the churches that ain't doing nothing right. so y'all could give y'all could be tied into somebody who who, and I'm not saying don't, I'm just saying break off another percentage for Cindy McKinney. You know what I'm saying? So I don't want you to get in spiritual trouble, but break off a, a, another percentage for uh, Cynthia McKinney so that it's, it's, it's material. Because in 20 years, when your, when your children and your grandchildren ask you, what was you doing? At the least, you could say that I supported somebody who was represented. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, but last but not least, I just want to say I think it's very important. Her voice is very important. And we can see who our friends and our enemies are, specifically as African people and, and the allies of African people can also see because who many of y'all I know as progressives listen to Amy Goodman, take note. She pro-imperialism when it comes to Africa. Right. Take yeah. note. Take note of that. And so I'm saying that so she's pro-imperialism when it comes to Africa. You know, when you see all of the Qaddafi stuff, that that the anti Qaddafi and you know, let's let's not play no games. That's this right. ain't not this not about one man. This is about the riches of a country. Right. About the country. So when she say the Qaddafi, I take it as if she's saying black people. You know what I'm saying? So but I, I think it's very important for us to take note in not just the black community, but our allies. Take note of that. You know, when it comes to us, she's pro imperialism. So I ain't gonna this aren't our speech, but thank y'all for having us. Let me say that that gives me hope. I mean, see young brothers step up like that. That's, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Cool stuff. yeah. I see a young sister here out of Dallas, yeah. Texas. Yeah, just gave her a couple of copies of the Green Book, so she's got those, and of course she's she studying those. I'll get you one. <laughs> but you know, uh, to piggyback, if you will, and we know we don't deal with swine. That's right. <laughs> but... <laughs> When you're, on, when you're there on the ground, as Cynthia just talked about earlier, when we were in Libya, we were walking on the ground, and you see the type of development that was happening. Our uh, host shared with us that Libya had $89 billion that they saved up during the sanction period. So that money now was being spent to rehab that country and bring back housing and all of that. NATO's over there right now to destroy all that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Say it. 
$89 billion annually. So NATO's over there now to destroy that. Because again, you're talking about a free, liberated country with leadership who has courage beyond compare. And please go back, look at the speech, <clears throat> get a translated version of the speech that he did before the UN, where he said he was rambling. Go back and get that speech. Please. That brother walked through the history That's right. of the UN and the Security Council. And he talked about how these five, well, it was four at the time, because they voted China on. The others just placed themselves on the Security Council. Mm -hmm. And he said, those five countries who were supposed to prevent war hmm. have created more wars. Right. And you, I mean, and, and he talked about reopening the assassination investigation of Patrice Lumumba mm -hmm. and others. I mean. This brother walked them through the history of the world to show them those countries. That's why the Westerners walked out. Africans and others were up clapping their hands. Yes. That's right. Because he was talking about freeing the rest of the members of the UN, giving them some